Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Um, my name is Koen van Dalen. I work for the Flanders Heritage Institute agency, sorry, um, out of Belgium. Normally, I start a presentation like this with a slide about um, where is Belgium. But in this case, I think you all know where Belgium is since last week's tragic, tragic events. Um, my organization is based in the north of Belgium, just this place. Flanders is the part of Belgium that speaks Dutch. Um, a little bit of history about us. We're currently in our current form. We've existed since 2012. And before that, 2004, there were two separate agencies. One, this one, Rent and Erfgut, which dealt with spatial planning and heritage, specifically the management of heritage. The other one, Flemish Heritage Institute, dealing with research about heritage. But in 2012, both those were merged into one organization. Before 2004, there were also two organizations, but two different ones. So we've changed a few times. Um, some other important changes that have affected us recently is um, there's been a new heritage legislation in Flanders. It's gone into effect in 2015. Um, it was prepared for quite a long time. And it's the first ever unified legislation we've had about archaeology, cultural heritage, and cultural landscapes. So that's been quite a big change for us. It was adopted in 2015, but for the archaeological part, it's only been adopted since the 1st of January of this year. Other than that, our Flemish government has um, voted new leg legislation about open data since 2015. And there is a new project, a special project by the Flemish government called Radical Digital, freely translated radically digitally, um, which is a special project um, that aims to digitize all interactions between the civilians and the government by 2020. So a lot of things in government should be digital by then. It's a very ambitious project. Now, if I go back to 2012, the situation then, Basically, two organizations were being merged. As I said, the first one, uh, Remt and Erfurt, was heritage as a part of spatial planning. So the focus was spatial planning with some heritage. Um, this organization was very much a process-driven organization. It was about applying for a permit to renovate your house. It was about applying for a grant to um, do some construction work on a listed monument. So it's much about asking a question to the government and getting a reply. Technologically speaking, this organization was all about proprietary software, Java, .NET, Windows, and their IT was very much inward facing. All of those systems were about how can we make our work more efficient and how can we handle the cases. Um, and they had one big application called Bredero to do that. And this application was custom built for spatial planning and then heritage was kind of added to it. The second organization, the Flanders Heritage Institute, was uh, an independent organization. It was all about heritage, and specifically the research, doing inventories, archaeological activations, archaeological reports. Technologically speaking, it was a very different IT environment. It was all about open source, Unix, Linux, and PHP. And a lot of it was outward facing. So we had websites, we had databases who the general public could consult. Um, most of this was in one big inventory management system, which is still in effect today. So you can see there are two main issues here. We, have, we had two very different technological stacks. And the other one was we had two big monolithic applications that kind of did everything. I don't know how many IT people you know, but um, programming languages can be a very hot topic among IT people. Um, so we had to look for a holy grail which we find with, found with these guys. So we ditched uh, Java, .NET, PHP, we ditched all those languages, and we went with Python, um, which made everyone kind of happy, and no one unhappy. So our current technological stack kind of looks like this. Basically, a lot of Python, uh, PostGIS as a database, and a lot of JavaScript, Dojo, open layers, GeoServer, Elasticsearch for search. Um, so that was the easy part, actually, the technological thing. That was one quick decision, and then everyone was happy. The more complicated part is having those two big applications 
Um, the problem with them is they are too big to fail. Once you have a very big application, everything is in it. And if you want to change a little thing, you have to change a lot of big things. So we wanted to get rid of that and go for a lot of small specialized applications instead of one or two very big applications. So we, we uh, are rewriting things towards a service-oriented architecture in which we focus on the service contracts between several different applications and no longer on the implementations. So even though we're writing the newer stuff in Python, we're still interacting with older things written in PHP or Java or .NET if it really has to. Um, so it's quite easy to rewrite the service without impacting the entire system. We've made a conscious decision to go with REST and JSON over SOAP and XML. Like five years ago, SOAP was still a very big thing. Nowadays, I think most people are happy to get rid of it. Um, because for us, REST is much closer to the World Wide Web. It's much easier to read and debug as human, uh, humans. And also, um, as I say here, eat your own dog food. Our own user interfaces interact through our JSON services with our JSON services. So that there is no like JSON service for reading data and one for editing data. It's all one service. We use it ourselves daily. So if something breaks, we figure it out quite quickly. And less, we don't have to wait until someone tells us like your service has been down for a week or two. Um, within our application domain, we've divided, uh, we've, we've got two big types of applications. The first one is what we call an authoritative source, which is, um, the one and only source for a certain piece of information. A typical example here is like a heritage inventory. So there is only a one heritage inventory. We've seen other organizations or we had other systems where you had to copy data from one system to another system and then copy it again. And after a while the question is, which system has the real data? Um, so it should always be referenced, never copied. The data in those authoritative sources is very much permanent data. It's things that even within 10 or 20 years we would still like to know about. When we query those systems, it's all about data. It's like, um, where can I find churches in the east of Flanders from a Baroque period or style? And we make a distinction between primary and secondary authoritative sources. The primary ones being the ones who are our core business, like the heritage inventory. The secondary ones being um, things like Thesauri or a database of architects, who if you weren't managing heritage, we wouldn't be interested about. They're there to support the primary ones. Now, as you can see, this comes mainly from the Flanders Heritage Institute as an organization. It's very much data focused. The second one is uh, the process applications. Um, these are applications that we use to guide a certain user through a process. It can be one or more users. It's a very a workflow. It's like there's a step here, a step there, and then this person has to do this and this and this. It's like a wizard interface. It's very much workflow driven and is all about temporary data. We don't really care anymore exactly when a certain person did something 10 years from now. Most of the querying is workflow related, like um, how many days do we still have before we have to answer this letter? How many days do we have before someone needs to sign this document? Um, and basically these applications read and write to authoritative sources to store their data. So to make it a bit more concrete, this is an, an actual process. So the process of listing heritage. Um, it talks to several different authoritative sources. So there's one called dossiers, where the actual uh, data of the process is stored, the heritage objects that are being listed and where the final listed object ends up, uh, the mail application, where basically all letters that are being sent in and out of the organization are stored, um, the actor database, where everyone who is involved in the process is kept, and the decrease application, where um, all the, the legal documents that turn out of this process are stored. As you can see, this process also talks to an, uh, this authoritative source, which is an external authoritative source. It's one we're not managing ourselves. It's called CRAP. It's a nice name. Um, and it's the central address database for Flanders. So it contains all the addresses, or all the legal addresses that are allowed to be used in Flanders. It's managed by a different organization of the Flan Flemish heritage, uh, Flanders government. These two things are what we call components. They are reusable um, building blocks for applications um, that we can integrate in several different uh, applications. So like we have a document generator, which is a, a process, which is a web service where we can send data to a template and then generate documents from it. 
which are then stored in other places. It just generates the documents. Um, this one is called zoning, which I'll demonstrate a bit more, which is a, a UI-driven widget um, that allows our users to basically draw a contour on a map, which is the, the main um, thing it should do. But it does this by um, allowing the user to select different base layers. They can uh, draw on the map, but they can also like select a parcel. They can select an existing heritage object and click on it. Um, they can zoom to addresses. Finally, when they've digitized a certain polygon, we will then check the polygon and see um, what address should be attached to this thing, what parcel are, are in here, and we will generate like an alphanumeric description of this thing. So it does both purely JS and then more alphanumeric information. Technically speaking, this small component, which for the general end user is quite simple, um, talks to a lot of different things. So on the one hand, it uses the Inspire services that we are more or less all using now, both our own and the ones from Flanders Information. So we have the Heritage Information services. They have the more um, administrative base layers, uh, orthographic photos, even historic maps going back to the 18th century, which we can integrate because they've opened data inspired them. Um, other than that, we have two RESTful services. The first one is one that talks to our own PostGIS databases um, that get fed by our own authoritative sources. It's basically a simple service that says, given a certain polygon, which kind of heritage objects are located in this polygon. Um, it's something you could do with WFS as well, but it's much more performant to do it customly based on our own database. And we can control the output a bit better, um, so it's closer to our RESTful services. This one is another custom um, component we've built that basically turns two SOAPful services that aren't provided by us into a RESTful service that we do control, mainly because A, um, talking to SOAP from JavaScript is probably possible, but not a good idea. Um, and even then, these services aren't the best performing services, so we can cache it a lot here and make it a lot faster. So our own architecture is very much um, a resource-oriented architecture. Um, in our case, we define as a resource as an information object we wish to describe. Uh, in typical RDF REST linked data fashion, it's uniquely identified by a uh, URI. And it should always be web addressable through HTTP. We very much apply the REST principles. So for us, a uh, resource identifies a URI identifies a resource, not an action. We don't have things like uh, besluiten uh, show by ID one or add new .php, which is not a resource; it's an action. Um, in our case, the actions get described by using the HTTP verbs, so we can get a certain resource, we can post to a collection of resources, meaning add something new to the collection, or we can delete something uh, from a resource. Now the question becomes, what does a certain URI identify? Um, does the URI identify the thing you're describing or the document about the thing? So, um, in our case, there's a document we use called uh, Cool URIs for the Semantic Web, um, with us the tagline, Cool URIs Don't Change. It's basically about how can you make the distinction between the information object and the documents about the, the information object. So we host an information object URI on a different domain than a um, document URI. One of the main reasons also that um, if your main your documents reside on a domain that's tied to your organization name and your organization name changes, which as I've shown before tends to happen quite a lot, then you're stuck with either changing your URIs or redirecting a lot. So what we do is we host an information object URI on a domain called id.adfood.net, which is not our organization name. Um, and we basically redirect from there to this place, which is the document URI. And then through content negotiation, the client can ask, OK, I want to see the HTML version, the RDF version, the JSON version, or whatever we're uh, publishing. We're very much a big fan of the URIs, so we're even using them on paper now. When we're sending out letters to people, we're including the URI to the resource the letter's talking about, 
So they can just enter it in their browser and they redirect it to the, the file, the dossier about the thing we're communicating about. So in the end, we end up with a, this whole web of resources. We have heritage objects, which is designated uh, in another object. It's, the designation is decreed in a certain file. This file has a, a this decree has a type. Uh, there's an actor there, and uh, there's a file there, there's an actor there. So we have a lot of interlinking authoritative sources. Now, um, going with a distributed system is nice, but it does create certain problems because if you have just have one database and you want to delete a record, the database has links to all the records and can tell you like you shouldn't be deleting this because it's still linked to another record. Once you're dealing with um, a distributed system, that's no longer the case. So we've built like a central repository for all our URIs where we can ask questions like is this URI still being used by an application? If so, which one? Um, it, this uh, user can query for this. They can basically say like, okay, this object, where is it being used? So in this case, this actor object is being used about 7,000 times. It would be a bad idea to delete this. Even if they were to forget to check before they try to delete it, it would just, the system would tell you like, you can't delete this because it's still tied to another object. But it's not 100% foolproof because you're on the World Wide Web and there is some lag and so it's not, but I think it's, uh, generally, our systems are accustomed to dealing with the fact that there might be missing data. Now, publishing the stuff as uh, linked data, we make a distinction. Well, first of all, open data um, in Flanders, it's all of this, there's a free Flemish open data license, and we also publish under the CC BY, um, just to make it simple. We have two different types of information. We have the collections and the um, individual resources. Generally, our collections are using search APIs with um, bookmarkable URIs, so you can actually bookmark your query, and most of them will give you back either HTML as a web interface, JSON, or CSV as a query. Individual ones will go through content negotiation using the HTTP accept header. We will give you back HTML, JSON, RDF, XML, RDF turtle, and if you want to add more serializations, that shouldn't be a hard thing. Um, the actual publishing as RDF, because we're dealing with resources, and our authoritative sources is quite simple. Whatever we have as a resource becomes the subject of an RDF triple. Um, our attributes in our database become predicates, and the values of them become objects, either literals um, within a database or URIs if we're talking about uh, communications between different, um, different systems. Uh, we have built a custom, or we are building a custom ontology um, to help define the RDF. Um, we're mainly using new classes to define our authoritative sources. When it comes to properties, we try to reuse, reuse what's out there and only invent something new if we really have to. Um, so the actual, we're also using those properties in our databases as relationship types, so it's, get, it's getting mingled, um, the linking. As you can see, it's a small step to uh, go from actually um, storing the data and publishing it as RDF. The distinction is quite small, and it's within the system itself. There is no ex um, ETL step. There is no uh, separate RDF repository. It's all combined. Uh, in the end, we end up with something like this, which is like an export uh, in RDF. So. What do we do with linking to other data? Um, within Belgium, there's a, there are two open data portals that we care about, one in Flanders and one for the federal government. I've just recently had a look there, and there's not that much potential for us for linking there, because A, there's a lot of aggregated data, things like how many police precincts are there per square mile of country, which is something from a heritage standpoint you can't really do a lot with. Um, there is some open data, geodata, but there's nothing URI in there. It's all about uh, web services, uh, mainly about displaying information, and not a lot about actually consulting it or um, linking to it. Uh, on international level, again, GIS-wise, it's quite easy to find some information. We link to the, uh, we include the Dutch services, for instance. We have a geo portal where we include the Dutch services. Um, so we can see both Flemish and Dutch heritage in one map, which is nice if you're working in the border area and you need to see about a certain archaeological site if it's crossing the borders. 
Um, and we also have included the Imperium Romanum base map from Palagios as a, uh, a nice example of a different base map. What we also try to do is we link our own uh, vocabularies who are in SCOS format with either the AAT or the Getty vocabularies or the English heritage, um, Historic England heritage data um, vocabularies so that we can say that our concept of a church matches their concept of a church. It's a small thing, but it's one of the few easy steps to take, I think. Uh, in practice, this uh, geomap thing, for instance, looks like this. So this is a part of, uh, this is Flanders, this is Atuatuka. It's projected on the Plagios base map, and this is the Dutch data, the red ones. Um, so it's a nice example of, with minimal effort, um, creating new information systems. So, as a small conclusion, we went from uh, some monolithic systems to more distributed systems. Our business applications are very much built upon the concept of resources. We um, deal with URIs on a daily basis, but most of our users don't realize it, because most of them find them to be very daunting. In our case, linked data is no longer an afterthought, but it's ingrained in the systems. And when it comes to open data, we can frequently use it for uh, GS data, but we would really like to see more URIs within our own country. Thank you. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. And uh, maybe if someone, we have a GitHub repository, if people are interested in open source software, some of the things we've done has been open sourced, so uh, feel free to consult. Thank you. Thank you.